People in Japan have a crucial decision to make before they close out 2014. They're voting in a general election on Sunday. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his Liberal Democratic Party returned to power less than two years ago, but he's put his sizable majority in the lower house on the line. Our special coverage, Japan Decides, will look at the key issues ahead of Election Day. Voters are considering how Abe has handled relations with Japan's neighbors. They'll rate him on his work in foreign diplomacy and defense policy during his second term in office. And they're deciding whether to support the course he's been steering the country in what he calls a rapid, rapidly changing security environment. NHK World's Tomoko Kamata reports. About a week before Prime Minister Abe dissolved the lower house, he made his 50th visit to a foreign country. This time, it was to China. And the world was watching. Ties between the two countries have frayed since 2012. In September of that year, Japan nationalized the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. Japan controls the islands and the government maintains they are part of Japan's territory. China and Taiwan claim them. Soon after, Coast Guard officials saw Chinese government ships intruding in Japan's waters. There was a spike in 2013 of 188 vessels. That number dropped to 81 this year. Abe's visit to Yasukuni Shrine last December further froze relations. The shrine honors Japan's war dead. Those remembered include leaders convicted of war crimes after World War II. Chinese leaders say the visit aims to glorify Japan's past militarism and aggression. But this handshake took to be the start of a fall in relations. In November, Prime Minister Abe and President Xi Jinping held their first summit. Neighbors should maintain dialogue. I believe we can find ways to resolve any kind of challenges through frank discussions between leaders. But there's another neighbor to mend relations with, South Korea. Japan and South Korea also have disagreements over history. North Korea's nuclear and missile development is another concern. Authorities in Pyongyang launched ballistic missiles into the Sea of Japan multiple times this year. And amid what Abe is calling a changing security environment, his cabinet approved a landmark change in policy. In July, they decided to reinterpret the Constitution to enable the country to use the right to collective self-defense. It allows Japan to defend a closely related country under attack, like this scenario where Japan's maritime self-defense force ships defend a U.S. naval vessel. Past leaders interpreted the Constitution to mean Japan cannot take such actions. But Abe says the country must change course. Making all possible preparations will in itself serve as the power to thwart attempts to wage war on Japan. This is deterrence. Some opposition parties are critical of Abe's defense policy, saying it's against the Constitution. Abe wants a strong mandate to enact it. And so he turned to the voters. Japanese and South Korean firms usually compete uh, pretty fiercely in the region, but in Indonesia, they're actually business partners. Top business lobbies from both countries have met for the first time in seven years and agreed to promote joint energy development in Southeast Asia. HK World's Shohei Yano takes a look at this. In the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, managers at major Japanese trading company, Mitsubishi Corporation, and Korea Gas Corporation are working together. They are meeting with local employees. 
the two firms are jointly developing liquefied natural gas in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. The joint venture will handle everything, including producing and supplying the gas. Started three years ago, the project is the first of its kind in the world. Its total operating costs are $2.8 billion. <laughs> About 30 employees from Japan and South Korea are permanently stationed at the Ventures headquarters in Jakarta. They plan to start production next year. We hope to build a relationship with our South Korean partner in which we can be frank about everything. Japan and South Korea are teaming up because both countries face the same challenge, a lack in energy resources. Japan is the world's largest LNG importer, and South Korea comes second. So far, the Western oil majors have controlled much of the world's LNG production. Japan and South Korea have had to face through the nose to get the gas. What's more, emerging economies such as India and China have started buying up LNG too. Securing stable supplies has become a major challenge. So, the Japanese and South Koreans decided to partner up. They are hoping that taking the lead in production will give them a stable and reasonably priced supply. The joint venture is expected to produce 2 million tons of LNG annually. The gas will be supplied to Japanese power utilities and the Korean Gas Corporation for the next 13 years. Korean officials say they have high hopes for further cooperation with Japan. We need more experience in overseas operations and in gathering information. Japanese firms are well plugged in globally. We feel they are the best possible partner. Our way of thinking is similar to the South Koreans. That's a big help when we work together. We find that they are easy to work with because we can quickly understand each other. Mitsubishi and Korea Gas have also set up a joint venture in Canada. The two sides are in the final stage of negotiating for a new LNG development project. They hope their partnership will lead to others. Researchers at electronics firm Toshiba have high hopes for a technology called artificial photosynthesis. They hope to use it as a way to produce new sources of fuel. The idea is to recreate the way green plants convert sunlight into energy. The researchers presented their findings at a conference in western Japan. They say they achieved an energy conversion rate of 1.5 percent. This is comparable to the conversion rate of algae and the highest ever reached in a laboratory. This is the experiment. It shows bubbles coming out of a catalyst. The catalyst is made of gold with a specially treated surface. The bubbles are carbon monoxide. The mechanism works when sunlight strikes a semiconductor and breaks water down into hydrogen and oxygen while removing the electrons. The energy of the electrons transfers to the gold catalyst and converts carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. The gas can be used to produce methanol fuel. Engineers say artificial photosynthesis can help ease the effects of global warming. That's because it can absorb carbon dioxide from the air. Experts in the field have welcomed news of the breakthrough. An energy conversion rate above 1% represents great progress. Now we're seeing growing hopes for the technology. But experts warn that artificial synthesis won't be commercially viable until the conversion rate reaches 10 percent. Toshiba researchers hope to achieve that goal in early 2020. Visitors to a botanical garden north of Tokyo are getting a chance to see things in a different light. As the evening draws near, a special display brightens the whole place up. Every year, 
around this time, the Ashikaga Flower Park in Tochigi Prefecture is illuminated with about two and a half million LED lights. A trellis of Japanese wisteria has lights that change along with music. The display also features a Christmas tree that stands 23 meters tall. <laughs> Everything was shining bright. It was so beautiful. It was really cold, but definitely worth coming. The event will run until February 5th. Millions of tourists have landed in Japan this year, more than 10 million just at the end of October. That's how many visited Japan in all of 2013. Many foreigners are finding it easier to get visas. Others are finding the weaker yen is working in their favor. Well, people who run businesses here couldn't be happier. They feel domestic consumers are becoming more frugal, so they're hoping tourists will help their bottom line. Foreign tourists are heading for a wider range of destinations. A growing number each year visit Takayama City in central Japan. Many of them participate in a cycling tour. The activity has become popular by word of mouth as an opportunity to meet and talk with local residents. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. A group of tourists from Taiwan is putting Shizuoka Prefecture on their itinerary. It's Japan's largest tea producing region. They are here to visit a Japanese tea room. Last year, more than 70% of reservations here came from overseas. Foreign tourists in Japan are spending more than ever. Japan's tourism agency estimates they pumped nearly 550 billion yen, or over four and a half billion dollars into the economy between July and September this year. A lot of that goes on shopping. This store in Tokyo offers duty-free shopping and is crowded with foreign tourists. Here, wristwatches are flying off the shelf. They're durable, at the same time, uh, they're reasonably priced. So it's a good fit for uh, travelers or those who want to shop and that. Mitsuyotsu. Many tourists buy three or four of the same item. Japanese maker Seiko Watch is enjoying the increase in spending by foreign visitors. The firm's shipments of wristwatches to stores in Japan rose more than 10 percent in October, year on year. It's strengthening its overseas PR to appeal to those planning to visit Japan. Seiko Watch began airing this TV commercial in China in September. We are aiming to advertise our products to foreigners before they come to Japan. We will stress the quality of made in Japan goods and promote them to foreign tourists. Many in Japan feel the momentum of increasing numbers of foreign visitors must not be lost. They're hoping the spending power of tourists will help revitalize businesses across the country.